It's The List and your boy with Jimmy Van and Sean Ross. Ah! With Jimmy and Sean, sell pills for your dumb. Make a fantastic song. Make a fantastic song. What's up, you guys? It's January 8th, 2020. Feels like a month since we've done this show. But we got the collector's edition there. We got Listen to Girl talking WWE theme song. But we have Jimmy Van back. Jimmy, I bet you're not wearing the shoes I bought you. Pretty good guess. I'm not yet. Not today. Embarrassing. Not Embarrassing. today. Embarrassing. It's because they're so pristine. I don't want to dirty them up, Sean. That's why. Hmm. It's like a work of art in a box. You know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't rub the Mona Lisa all over the carpet. Damn. That's how I look at it. So how you doing, man? How was uh, how were your holidays? How was your New yeah. Year? Pretty good. Got a little bit more time off than usual. Like Hulk Hogan didn't take a dump out of a moving vehicle into oncoming traffic or anything. That's good. So I didn't have to like go crazy. It was it was a really quiet holiday season as it pertains to wrestling news. And yeah, it was it was it was pretty quiet. Got some time off. It was nice. And uh, as you know, my wife has started her job now, so it was good to get to. to spend some time with her uh which may never happen again based on schedules and the crazy january that's happening in wrestling and mma awesome well you uh inspired my new year's eve sean ross app oh you did you inspired it so the night of december 30th i'm sitting at home with my wife and my wife throws this whole hey do you want to go for dinner tomorrow night thing at me Mm -hmm. And you got to understand, Toronto is a major metropolitan city. Camilla will tell you getting a reservation last minute on New Year's Eve is a challenge. Yeah. Um, but for my wife, because she's at home with the kids a lot, so for my wife, I, uh, I was able to get us a reservation at a pretty nice restaurant. Went out for dinner on, Chris on uh, New Year's Eve. And, uh, you know, we wrap up dinner. We go back home, and uh, my in-laws are over at the house, and it's like, oh, what do you want to do? Well, Sean Ross Sapp has sent a tweet at about coming to America. And I haven't seen coming to America in a while. And I'm a big Eddie Murphy fan from that time period, 80s and 90s. So we all uh, put on coming to America on New Year's Eve before the ball dropped, Sean. That's pretty good. I watched it. I enjoyed it. There's a lot of 80s movies and really 90s movies that I never got the opportunity to watch. Uh, the highlight to me was Samuel L. Jackson before he was... The Samuel L. Jackson we know now, but exactly like that Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, he was exactly in yeah, there. Yeah, it was perfect. It was perfect to me. I, I've I have probably seen Coming to America a hundred times, and uh, so all the scenes I know them, and uh, you know they're doing a sequel, and uh, a lot of people, myself included, I'm not a big fan of sequels because they always screw up the original, and Eddie yeah. Murphy seems cognizant of that, and I've I've seen interviews with him where he has said. I'm not going to mess it up. All the characters from Randy Watson to the yeah. barbershop guys, I think even Louis Anderson, they're all back in the sequel. And, yeah. so, uh, and so it should be a lot of fun. But I, Eddie Murphy, that time period, he was awesome. I'm sure you've seen Trading Places, right? I haven't. I'm going to watch that very My soon. My God, how have you not seen some of these movies? How is yeah, this possible? I've, I don't know. I had never watched A Lethal Weapon before last year. That was, That one was... That one was a real surprise to me because, you know, a lot of those 80s movies were before MMA was around. Yeah. So a lot of the fight scenes are absolute dog shit, like real bad, real cheesy. Then I watch Lethal Weapon and the final scene, I'm like, what? This punching is really technical. And I'm like, is Mel Gibson going for a triangle choke? Mm -hmm. Like it was. And then I find out that a Gracie choreographed the fight scenes. Right. And that's why they looked so good. So that one was was very good. I really love that. There's there's a ton of stuff. Like really, I watched like Beverly Hills Cop one, two, and three when I was a kid, and that was about it. Like I did. There was a lot of good stuff I missed out on. You have missed out on a lot. You have to watch uh, watch The Golden Child. It's really good. That's an Eddie Murphy movie. Definitely watch Trading Places. Really good movie. He's done. Eddie Murphy did a lot of good stuff back then. And oh, yeah. Then, then after that, you know, his his uh, his script choices kind of went off, you know, kilter a little bit. But that stuff was really good. Uh, so, so to me, first off, to put a bow on this, like when I see him playing all these characters, I always thought that just kind of started with Nutty Professor. I didn't realize that started so many years back. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah so I'm I'm getting educated on a lot of this Arsenio stuff. Arsenio Hall so, too. Arsenio Hall played a lot oh, of those God, characters he was, too. 
I missed Arsenio Hall. I used to watch his talk show when I, I was did a little too. kid. I did too. I because he, he was him and Regis Philbin were the only guys that had pro wrestlers in the mainstream. Yeah. Back then. So I used to watch both of them. Uh, I, people might be wondering about the YouTube thing. I'm still working on the YouTube thing. Obviously, the good news is now that the holidays are over, people are back from the, back from the holidays. The bad news is their inboxes are loaded. And so it's going to take a little bit of time. I'm, uh, I'm working on uh, two different people at Warner Brothers, and uh, I got one connection at YouTube. And so we'll see what happens. The only unfortunate reality, if I'm being very honest, is that, you know, Fightful was a channel of about 25,000 subscribers, and to YouTube it's not really priority. Mm -hmm. It's not like the, one of the Paul brothers that aired a guy hanging from a tree uh, in wherever he was, China, and because he's got millions of subscribers, they took him down until the dust settled, and then they brought him back. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they're not going to lo lose was, that revenue. You mean the one who went into the suicide forest? Yes. In Japan, yeah. And they brought him well, back after the dust settled when he when he when he showed footage of a guy hanging. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, so you said you talked to people at Warner Brothers. Was it Pinky? Was it the Brain? Was it Slappy the Squirrel? Okay, I, ho I hope they don't watch this because I don't want you to just, like, fuck up my chances of getting this thing fixed. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. They're Warner Brothers characters, Jimmy. Yeah, but I don't know about their sense of humor, Sean. Well, I mean, it that is one of their shows, so I mm. hope they have some sort of sense of humor. But uh, I, I am going to start to roll out some of the video interviews in in the coming weeks. I was trying to put it off till we got our channel, but I'm sitting on some interviews that need to come out. Yeah. So uh, there's one good one you all are going to see clips from. Uh, I want to go ahead and plug this. Chris Michaels, a guy who has done enhancement stuff for WWF, WCW. Uh, he almost got signed by TNA back in the day. And if you look at him, you would see that he would really have fit in with the Naturals and America's Most Wanted. Uh, he did a Performance Center guest coaching gig uh, a few months ago. And we talked about it. It's uh, a really – it's a long-form interview, a long-form article. It's about 7,000 words. We've got a clip for you today. And uh, the end of that article will have some pretty cool news that kind of, I don't want to say puts a row or, or a bow on that story, but really brings it full circle and is a happy continuation, I think, for a guy that's had a lot of opportunities but has never been quite given that big shot. So that interview is dropping on my channel Thursday, uh, I think 11 a.m., 10 a.m. I'm, I'm debuting it. So make sure you guys check that out. You all keep wanting me to do more non-AEW and WDB stuff. So I'm reaching out. I'm going uh, to a lot of places now. I'm traveling more than ever, Jimmy. There you go. Yep. A couple other things I want to touch upon. So the first one is I have a uh, cameo uh, from a WWE superstar. Sean has seen it. I showed it to him. Uh, this WWE superstar asked me to delay it by a week. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to air it uh, probably at the top of the show on next week's List on You Boy. And then I will explain uh, why they asked me to delay it by a week. But uh, it's cool, and, uh, and so you can check that out. The other thing I want to touch upon is anybody that's new to this podcast might not know that three years ago-ish when we started, Sean Ross Sapp, Sapp had short hair. Looked, yeah. like, looked like a different guy than, than, than what he looks like now. And he decided, to his credit, to uh, completely transform his appearance for charity uh, because he's going to cut off his hair and donate it to charity. What's the charity again that you're going to donate it to, Sean? Uh, I, right now it looks like it's wigs for kids. Although, um, based on who we're talking to, if they would like me to donate it to somebody else, I'm, I'm open to that because of the situation that we're, we're presented. Yeah. Well, yeah. Th this is public enough that I'm going to talk about it. So on December 20th, I sent a tweet to Brandy Rhodes. Uh, funny enough, that was the day of our holiday party and I was like killing a little bit of time before, uh, the, the, we had like this limo bus that came and got us. I was killing a little bit of time before that. I sent a tweet to Brandy Rhodes uh, Camilla, put up the tweet that I sent to Brandy Rhodes on December 20th. I said, hey, Brandy Rhodes, our own Sean Ross Sapp has been growing out his hair in order to donate it to Wigs for Kids. One idea we have is for the Nightmare Collective to cut it. If you're game, I'll fly SRS to the location of your choice. Wouldn't you know, within minutes, <laughs> like, took her no time, within minutes. And you don't even have a blue check mark, Jim. Uh, yeah, I don't even have a blue <laughs> check mark, and boy, am I ever d devastated about that. But uh. Brandy Rhodes sent me this response, Camilla. Put that up from Brandy Rhodes. I love how she called me Mr. Van when Van's not my last name, but that's awesome. Mr. Van, I will cut Sean Ross Sapp's hair on my terms, of course. Tell Mr. Sapp to reach out to my PR team. This will be the best decision he's ever made. Uh, do you want to talk, Sean, about where things stand with that, or do you just want to say high level, I've talked to her and we're working on it? 
that is what's happened. I have talked to her and the PR team, and I don't have an idea what they have planned. Uh, one, one of the things brought up, which I mentioned to you and I want to explain to people because they'll be like, oh, well, why aren't you getting your head shaved? Here where I live in rural Kentucky, that has a really bad like political and connotation, yeah. social connotation and stuff. Yep. And I know to some people that might sound a little bit ridiculous, but it does, especially – uh, the area that I'm from, so I don't want to go that route. Also, I would like to eventually maybe donate again. I don't know if I have the patience for that, Jimmy. Um, I'm rolling my hair up in car windows and all kinds of weird stuff now. I didn't expect this, but yeah, when appearing, came, appearing in WWE 2K. I mean, all this yeah. stuff you weren't expecting. Yeah, and it's weird because you know I, I it's it. A lot of the people that tweet me are the same people that have tweeted me for years, and the, uh, sometimes those are the ones who get through the, the Twitter filters even because I've, I've filtered a lot of that stuff. But it's weird for me to think, oh, yeah, well, in 2007 when I started to do this, I had like three or 4,000 followers, and now I've got like 10 times that. So, of course, there are going to be some people that have no idea that I – ever even had short hair here or especially since we don't have a goddamn YouTube for people to refer to but uh, it like people will look back and th like I'll see people that are like you had short hair like when did that happen yeah I'm like it happened for 30 years of my life before this happened so yeah it's, well and now I'm used to it it's pretty weird I've told Sean off the air uh, and and I'm pretty honest and public about everything whether I should be or not but I, I told Sean off the air my only concern with this whole thing is if anybody watched uh, Dynamite last week, it felt to me like they pivoted with, with some mm -hmm. of their creative. And I, I know that we talked in, in at length on the show about a lot of the holes in their structure. Uh, and they had a lot of holes in their structure, which it looks like they addressed. But it was very noticeable to me on Dynamite last week. There was no Dark Order aside from one quick little little video. There was no Nightmare Collective. And they're calling the babyface group of uh, Cody and Dustin, they're calling them the Nightmare Family. And when you look at all of that, I was telling Sean off the air, I wonder if they're going to disband the Nightmare Collective. Because if they are, that might be the end of the haircut idea. Uh, but at the same time, it is for charity, and Brandy is a charitable type. So maybe she's still yeah. going to want to do it just for that reason. It, regardless, we're going to do something cool. Yes. No matter what happens, even even if worst case scenario, that does happen, we'll figure out something cool to do right. eventually. Because fortunately, we do have enough connections in the wrestling world to make that happen. Um I mean, hey, this was an idea I had floated to people in WWE in the past, and WWE PR never got back to me about it. So, right, uh, and, and I did that privately. But a lot of credit to Brandy Rhodes, and hey, you can think what you want about the Nightmare f Collective thing, but I think this is really cool. Yeah, and I hope we can do something really cool. Uh, I I don't know of any plans to maybe raise additional money for a charitable cause, but I would love to do that too. I would hope that maybe we can get some other people in the future to consider growing out their hair. I'm going to do a video about why I'm growing out my hair for those of you who don't know that I'll have on my channel eventually. But yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting and I'm a little nervous. I don't know how dumb I'm going to look with short hair again, but you'll look fine, especially when I DM uh, Brandy and tell her like, go, I want her to like do one buzz, like a bald buzz here. That ain't happening. No, like she'll make like it's accidental. But if she does like one here, then you'll have no choice but to go for like a mohawk or something. That ain't happening. Because you're going to have to even it out, you know? My my so. wife has nixed that idea. I mean, if it's accidental, there's not a lot you can it do does, about it. It does not matter. That that has been nixed officially. How, the, do, you, how the, do you nix accidents? How is that possible? It ain't happening. It ain't happening, Jimmy. Camilla, it how do you nix an accident? How do you if do you that? If you think that I'm possible. upset about the YouTube thing... You do that, I'll be even more upset for the oh, reasons that I outlined now earlier. Now I'm tempted. Now yes. I'm tempted. No, I'm not I'm not trolling. I don't want that shit to happen. All right. So let's talk about AEW's first full year. Uh, how would you grade their first full year? How do you think things ended up for them as a company, as a product, all of that? It's weird to think that it's their first full year, right? Because mm -hmm. we didn't see a show until May and no TV until October. Ah. It's tough because it's like I think a lot of people – there were some people who came in expecting them to compete with WWE immediately. That ain't happening, and that's not what they really want to do. If you ever hear Jim Ross talk, he says, we want to make money, we want to create jobs, and we want to create an alternative. Right. And if they keep that path, I think they're going to be all right. I think they're going to do okay. 
Um, there are some missteps, of course. Not everything's going to be universally awesome. Yep. I mean, I think NXT is the best show on TV, but Jimmy, how long has the NXT brand existed? It's existed since the reality series, like a decade now, right? So NXT wasn't always the hottest thing on TV. As far as a grade, I'd give them a C plus or a B minus, maybe. I'd probably give them a B plus. Uh, and the reason I'd give them a B plus is because they were this brand new entity that came out of nowhere. They uh, drew in excess of a million viewers a week on TNT. First of all, they got the TNT deal. Uh, and that alone, I mean, look at Jeff Jarrett's struggles, look at Impact's struggles, look at Billy Corgan's struggles. The fact that they got a TV deal in itself is is impressive. Plus, they got television time in, in Canada, they got television time in the UK. So all of that in and of itself is impressive. They're doing a million viewers a week if you include DVR uh, on TNT. That's pretty solid. They've been doing 100,000 uh, buys per pay-per-view. They've been doing about 5,000-ish ticket sales per live event. When you look at all of that, that's all very impressive for a new entity. But for me, like you said, there have been a lot of creative missteps. And for me, again, it wasn't so much the angles. I mean, yeah, the Dark Order thing was goofy and, and the Nightmare Collective was a little bit odd and redundant. But for me, it wasn't so much the angles as it was the uh, the flaws in the structure from poor timing of the shows, doing angles uh, during commercial breaks, progressing angles during BTE because they assume everybody watches it, which they don't, uh, progressing angles on dark, again, assuming people watch it when they don't. They didn't understand their audience, and, and I really was critical of Cody Rhodes because Cody Rhodes, of all of those guys with the exception of Jericho, Cody's got the most experience. Yeah. when it comes to television. And Cody was as flawed as the rest of them in terms of, well, I'm going to focus on the audience that got us here. Again, not recognizing your TNT audience, they're not all watching be, uh, being the elite. They're not all watching dark. And you're making a big mistake by thinking that. I felt like, yes. I felt like when you watched last week's show, it's like almost like a light switch went off a little bit because they didn't do stuff during the commercial breaks, aside from Guevara stuff, which I thought was pretty funny. But mm -hmm. otherwise, they didn't really do anything. I didn't watch BTE, and I didn't watch Dark, so I don't know if they progressed storylines again. And if they did, they have to learn not to do that. But I felt like they made strides. And the other thing that I thought they were making a mistake with before was they didn't have the top stars on television every week. So you wouldn't see Omega every week. You wouldn't see Moxley every week. Jericho, I think, was there every week because he's the champion. Yeah. But you wouldn't see Omega. You wouldn't see Moxley. And they have to have their top guys every week, if not in a match, at least in a promo. And last week, everybody was there. And it's, it's you know, great. you could say, well, they had everybody there because it was the January 1st show. And mm -hmm. so we have to see how things are going to be, you know, within the next few weeks again and see if they kind of go back to where they were. But uh, I thought they made strides last week. So I want to see if they kind of can stay the course with that stuff. So uh, another thing that we're kind of learning, and again, I, I don't think that Nielsen's accurate by any stretch, but it does paint a, a pretty, at least a, a fairly vague picture. We, we've learned that with DVR viewership, even though it's down to like 800,000-ish, 700,000-ish, and 900 and something thousand when they went unopposed, that it's actually closer to 1.2, 1.3 million per week. But yeah. that's that's also the victim of their demographic because they yes. do have that younger demographic, and the younger demographic is like oh, catch it later, yep. whatever. Yep, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out or I'm gonna do something else. And uh, as we've mentioned before, advertisers aren't particularly keen on that. Yep, which I I do think is a good reason why they do some stuff during the commercials because it makes it a little more DVR proof, though no program is truly DVR proof. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I see a lot of story being told on Dark and on the Road 2 shows. The Road 2 shows are awesome, but not everybody watches those. And yep. that's something that I wish WWE would implement better too. Like they, they have Becky Lynch go to the ring and they say, here's a video instead of while she's walking down to the ring, let us hear her initial pop. Then show us that damn video. At the end of the video, cut to her in the ring reacting to that video, and you you have the story told that you want to be told. There's nothing wrong with Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus and all that stuff coming out to the ring. You get their pop. You see them react to a video, a Road 2 video. Then we bring out the next person. That's a little bit different, too. I, I'm on board with them not doing the invisible camera thing, but they started to do that a little bit, which I, I wasn't keen on. But it has to be a true alternative. And 
it was, but I think too much of the story was told out in front of the crowd on that stage of the ring as opposed to utilizing the the production that they have and the storytellers that they have. I think they could do better with that. I also think that they think that their audience is too inside. Yeah. And 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 granted, they do have a, a, a very heavy, you know, Internet audience. I mean, that's how they were able to draw 100,000 buys without TV. So they do have a heavy Internet audience. But there's still a line between being a smart fan and being an inside fan. And one of the things that I've always not liked about the Young Bucks is that they do all this inside stuff that they think is cute and, and whatever. And there, it's a very small fraction of their audience that likes that stuff. Uh, and, and again, like for a lot of these guys, Omega and the Bucks especially, they're learning, on, they're learning on the job. These are executives that have never been in this position. They've never produced live television before. Uh, Tony Khan, never been in this position, never produced live television before. And I've seen guys defend them and say, oh, you have to cut them a break because they're learning on the job. I wouldn't have put them in that position if they had to learn on the job. You know what I mean? Exactly. You're, you've got, you've got, this is your shot. You've got live weekly television. You want to turn this into a rights fee deal. You have experienced people in these positions. And that was, I think, a major mistake. Uh, Tony Khan timing out the shows himself, major mistake. It's, it's a very important job. And if you've read J.J. Dillon's book, and he told uh, stories about how when he left WCW and went to WWE, and he was the one timing the shows in WCW, maybe the NWA then, I can't remember if it was still the NWA, but he left to go to WWE, the NWA didn't think enough about the, the importance of that job to get somebody devoted to it, and then some of their shows would get screwed up. They'd go out the air before the main event was over. Yeah, Tony Khan was not experienced at time out the shows, and it was a mistake having him do it. And uh, I hope they've learned to pivot, but if their mentality is, it's okay, we're going to make mistakes, but we're going to learn on the job, NXT is going to blow by them in the ratings yeah. if, that, if that's their mentality. But again, last week's show, to me, I thought there was a lot of positive steps taken. And, and so. the thing is, so much of this we have to compare to how awesome NXT is every week. Every week that show, even though it has probably about a good half hour of stuff that just doesn't need to be on there, right. it's always a really awesome show. It's usually the best show on TV, although I would argue that Monday Night Raw has actually been Better. exceptional the past month or so. Right. Uh, goodbye, Humberto Carrillo. But <laughs> You wanted him to be the man, didn't you? The, the mystery man. Oh, I would have been so mad. I, I literally would have messaged you and said, Jimmy, I'm not covering Raw next week. And it's in, it's in my hometown. It's in Lexington next week. Yeah, yeah. But AEW, the thing is, I think they've only had one bad show. But it's always got to be compared to how awesome NXT is. Right. That's, that's also a hurdle that Impact Wrestling TNA had to face for a long time. They used to have weeks and weeks of really good shows, I thought. But they had to fight the stigma of what they used to be, and they had to fight how good some other shows were. AEW doesn't have to fight the stigma of how bad they used to be. They're starting with a clean slate, right? Which is how you know you and I have talked in the past when certain properties get acquired. We're like, why didn't they just start something new? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But AEW has has that benefit and detriment, and we're seeing those benefits and detriments kind of play out in front of our eyes. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I you know obviously NXT has Triple H, and Triple H is a major asset. Uh, not just because he was a main eventer for 20 years and knows the business, but he was a part of production for many years before yeah. he before he took over NXT. And again, like there were guys on social media uh, because I, I've been critical of AEW when in terms of their structural issues and in terms of mistakes they've made in terms of production. And there have been a few guys that tried to critique that by saying, "Oh, what do you mean? They have Jericho and they have Cody." Cody had nothing to do with WWE production. Nothing. Yeah. He was a member of the talent roster. And so you can't use that and say, what do you mean? They have Cody Rhodes. He had nothing to do with anything. Jericho is the only guy they have with any semblance of experience. And even then, he wasn't sitting in production meetings every week. And he wasn't sitting in Gorilla with Vince on headset every week. Triple H was. And so he's, yeah. he's a major asset for NXT. And uh, I really hope that AEW figures things out. I mean, they got guys like Billy Gunn. Uh, Billy Gunn can be helpful to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, so I hope they use these guys. Let me ask you this next question. Who do you think will be the breakout stars in wrestling Ooh. this year, 2020? Who do you think the breakout stars will be in wrestling? I think Rhea Ripley, for one, will just continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Drew McIntyre's looking real good. I know He's we're going to awesome. talk about him. Yep. Um, I think depending on where Killer Cross can land, lands, he could be a big one for whatever brand he ends up on. Ah, man. Depends on how hot Luchasaurus stays and what they do with him. 
Uh, he could be very good and and how he really adapts to all that. Kota Ibushi in New Japan, I think, is prime. Even though he's been uh, established for a while, I think he's going to be a tip-top name, especially after Wrestle Kingdom. And I know there are more. This was a question that got asked on Fightful Select Q&A last oh, week, yeah. and I rattled off like 10 names, but some some really promising ones. There's There's a lot of people on the cusp. I would say more people on the cusp of being top people than we've seen since maybe the the maybe 10, 11, or 9, 10 years ago. Yeah. I agree with the names that you said, but I, I have additional names. I think Tessa Blanchard is going to leave Impact Wrestling. Uh, I think that oh, she, yeah. she's going to get money thrown at her. I think that it's going to be very tempting for her to go to WWE because of, you know, just the 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 money that they're going to be able to offer her and the platform and the people she'll be able to work like the Charlotte Flairs and whoever else. But I think that if Tessa Blanchard goes to AEW, she is going to rule the women's division. She's going to rule it. And with all due respect to Britt Baker and, mm-hmm. and Riho and the girls that they have in, in AEW, none of them could hold a candle to Tessa Blanchard. So if she chooses to go there, she's going to rule that division. She's going to be somebody to watch out for. I think that Darby Allen, so long as he doesn't get hurt, because I hate the coffin drop. I wish that he would chill on the coffin drop, especially <laughs> on the apron. I hate it. Uh, Darby Allen's going to be a star, and a lot of people compare him to Jeff Hardy, and he is very much like a young Jeff Hardy. He's got that look. The younger audience likes him. He's going to be a star so long as he doesn't get hurt. Keith Lee. I bet you Keith Lee's going to be in the Rumble, and I bet you that Keith Lee's going to get that spot where he tosses out like 10 guys because you can see at the Survivor Series that they like him. Like, you could see yes. it. Uh, and so I think Keith Lee is going to get an opportunity in 2020. And then the, the last guy on my list, and I've talked about him before, Montez Ford. I see so much in Montez Ford, and uh, no disrespect to the team or anything, but he's being held back a little bit with the Street Profits. I know he's still got to get used to working weekly television, and he's got to get used to doing things the way that they do it on the main roster. But uh, he, I think, is a single star in the making, and by the end of the year, he should be a bigger star than he is now. So those yeah. those are four people that I'm looking for this year as as doing big things. So I guess we'll on see On the flip happens. side, I personally, I think Montez has slipped a little bit just because of how he's been portrayed. I agree. Like, I thought that WWE's raw booking did him no favors. I think Matt Riddle slipped a little bit. I agree. Not in the ring or anything. It's just, what what's he doing, man? Like The, the Killian Dane thing has hurt Matt Riddle. Yeah. Because a lot of people looked at Killian Dane as this kind of cast off from the main roster that didn't, that didn't uh, succeed. Uh, whether it was his fault or not. That's, I think, how a lot of fans look at him. Then he goes into a program, and he beats Matt Riddle. So I, I think that definitely hurt Matt Riddle. I absolutely agree with you on that, and uh, he's got he so much potential. Since, hasn't wrestled since the Ono match, and I'm telling you. I'm not saying that Matt Riddle should be in a, a WWE title program right now, but if Brock Lesnar said anybody come out here, and I don't know if you watch Wrestle Kingdom, but no, if you did— No, talk about it, no. Kota Ibushi does this strike. Like, you know, they always do the strike trade. And when they start to do the strike trade with Ibushi, he just punches them once and they fall over. There is no strike trade. He just knocks them down and drills them and stares at him. If Matt Riddle walked out to the ring on Raw and hit him with a liver kick and Brock Lesnar came towards him, then doubled over with the liver kick, I think it would do a million things. You would immediately have a top star. If anybody did that to Brock Lesnar, they'd be a star. But there's one or two guys that can convincingly do that. Mm -hmm. And Matt Riddle has not been bogged down with bad WWE Raw booking or being kept off TV for months. Like, as much as I would like Aleister Black to be that guy, it's like, God, him just being on the main roster but not being on TV for months hurt him a little bit. It made him seem less important. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But... We're also going to see how it goes for the veteran Chris Michaels. Again, I've got a bit of news coming at the end of my uh, big feature on him that drops tomorrow morning, Thursday morning, for those of you who are, are watching this delayed. The interview in full is going to be up on YouTube.com slash SRS Wrestling and Fightful.com, and it's a little bit different. We've got some match footage integrated in. They were able to send us. It's a, it's a little bit of a different uh, production than we've done in the past. Uh, Take a listen to a little bit of a clip of him talking about his last performance center uh, experience. Actually, I have to give thanks to my son. Who's who's Uh, also involved in show business. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Walking Dead. A little little show. Yeah, just a little show, The Walking Dead. Yeah. But uh, 
he does my emails for me. Yeah. Like emailing people, posing as me. He'll email people. <laughs> yeah. He's always trying to help dad out. Well, he had emailed them down there, and it had been months ago. And one day he called me up, and I didn't answer right away. And he messaged, he said, 911. Oh, gosh. And I'm like, oh, my God, what's wrong with him or one yeah. of the grandkids? And uh, finally I called him back. He said, you're going to Orlando. You're going to Orlando. And I'm like, what for? We Oh, we're going back to Universal Studios. I miss it. <laughs> Harry like, Potter World. Yeah. He's like, no, no. He said, uh, you're going to the Performance Center. They want to bring you down as a guest coach. I'm like, who? Why? Why? <laughs> who? And anyway, that's that's how it came about. And um, we had to. They wanted me for a certain for a certain week, and I told them I couldn't do that. And I'm like, would, uh, but after that, I'm free. And then they shot me another week, and I'm like, yes, I'll do it. And then brought me down. They flew me down, and you know, put me up, and went to the performance center every day, and had to uh, live performance show uh, at the performance center, where all they get, you know, they yeah. look at, and they get in front of all the coaches and everything, and all the boys and uh, put on a show yeah. to get practice or whatever. And then Thursday and Friday were live NXT shows, and uh, I was in charge of um, being an agent for a match on there. Yeah. Each one of those. And uh, it, w it was an awesome experience. I was treated great and treated like I was one of them, and all the guys were um, receptive of my critique and actually asked me questions and stuff. And made me feel really special and i felt really good about it and then of course uh matt bloom told me he said uh, when you get home shoot me an email and let me know what how your week went and, yeah and i shot him one and i said hey if spot ever opens up yeah. i'd be glad to move down here i was gonna ask you about that yeah. but uh i was standing on the side of the ring we we're watching something going on and i was standing there next to uh scotty too hotty yeah scotty Scott taylor. taylor yeah and uh, he goes, I don't know about you, Chris. He said, but I'm glad I came up the way I did, and <laughs> me and you did. And he said, if I had to go through all this, just be a pro, I don't know if I'd do it or not. Because they're there from morning to night. Yeah. I mean, just nonstop. It, 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 it's a factory to yeah. bred wrestlers. Oh, and yeah. They're constantly training. And then I'm working out with these two guys from India, and they can't speak English, and they, then uh, I'm – just showing them the basics. Lock sure. up, uh, reverse this, reverse that. And they, okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we go English class now. Yeah. And, and then I'm in this classroom and we're watching everybody's matches and uh, they're stopping. They're like, well, okay, what could you have done here? And I'm like, God, I wish I had access yeah. to all this. And I was coming up, you know. It, it's just, it's something else. It's another world. Yeah, the way that uh, Shane Helms had always told me and it says it pretty publicly, he's glad that he came up the way he did that way people now don't have to and mm -hmm. he does wish that he had the benefit of all that stuff we're back full interview dropping on thursday i'm telling you it's a fun one he's had a lot of ups a lot of downs he's had opportunities in wcw tna wwf ovw he was brought in by jim Cornette to help shape guys like randy orton and shelton benjamin and give a more experienced hand to a lot of these guys that were in that class. And when I say that class, I mean like the special class. And I reached out to a lot of people who worked in OVW, had a lot of good things to say about him. So I'm really happy with how that story and interview unfolded. And like I said, some cool news at the end of that. But what else we got to talk about, Jimmy? You mentioned Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, I, I have not yet had a chance to see Wrestle Kingdom. I've seen a few clips here and there. I saw uh, the uh, Jushin Thunder Liger retirement ceremony, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I saw a little bit of stuff with Okada and Ibushi. Um, you watched every show. How was Wrestle Kingdom? I heard that uh, Takahashi Osprey was really good. Uh, Gosh, yeah. Okada Ibushi, from what I saw, was pretty good. How was Jericho? How was he? Because he's it's very obvious when you watch him. He's put on a lot of weight. And and yeah. so how was he uh, at Wrestle Kingdom? It was okay. Yeah? It, it wasn't – I didn't think it was a great match. I didn't think it was – I thought it was a solid match. Okay. I don't want to say good, great, anything like that. Him versus Taka, or Tanahashi in the type of match that they put on was a, a fine Wrestle Kingdom match. And you know what? I would – if you told me that I was going to get to watch about 20 more of those out of Chris Jericho, I'd say, yeah, sure. That's a good time. Right. Uh, nothing bad or anything. But Ibushi, I thought, stole. Uh, combined in night one and two, I thought Ibushi stole the show. 
But Hiromu Takahashi and Will Ospreay was the best thing that I saw all weekend. And I, I heard that. I heard it was really good. So I'm going to have to find the time to, uh, to look that up. Now, Jericho said one thing. I'm, I'm going to read a quote from him. He did, uh, you know, they always do the presser after the matches. And uh, so he did his presser. And he basically cut a promo. And it was in regards to the potential for an AEW New Japan uh, partnership. And here's a quote from Jericho. He said, put aside all the hurt feelings, put aside all the egos, put aside all the issues and politics and concentrate on great wrestling matches and big business. Uh, obviously, he had his belt with him. He displayed it in the <clears> ring. I also couldn't help but notice that when he displayed it at the presser afterwards, the camera zoomed out to get the whole belt in the shot, I yes. noticed. And so all I want to say is this. Obviously, New Japan's going to be fine without AEW. They just drew 70,000 people over two nights. Uh, they've got Ibushi, Okada, Osprey, Naito, Tanahashi. They have all these big stars there. Jay White is doing really well. So they're going to be fine. AEW is going to be fine with that New Japan. They got the TNT deal. They're doing over a million viewers a week. When you include the DVR, they're doing you know 5,000 uh, attendance per show. They're going to be fine. But can you imagine if both companies came, came together, how much stronger they would both be? Can yes. you imagine having Okada... Uh, in the ring on Dynamite, Abushi and Omega reforming their tag team on Dynamite. The Young Bucks back, you know, say at Wrestle Kingdom. Kenny Omega back at Wrestle Kingdom. It would make both companies stronger. Uh, and so I think they really need to uh, put some of those egos and politics aside, just like Jericho said, and the, and the hurt feelings and look at business. I think it would make both companies stronger if they did that. I think it'd be a game changer, Jimmy. And I've had a lot of weird people say stuff like, AEW needs to stand on their own and be their own company. I'm like, well, no. Impact did this with New Japan. Uh, CMLL does this with New Japan. Ring of Honor did it. WWE, WWE used to do it. Yeah, they used to do WWE it. WWE used to do it. Yep. They used to have titles that were just defended in Japan, for the love of God. Like, every company has worked with other companies at some point. That's just the way that it works. Everyone's been on, like, TV in that regard. WCW did it. Yep. That was a big part of their business was exchanging talent. Scott Norton was a guy over here and he went to Japan and became the guy there. Yeah. Yep. I think, and then this is just, per, okay. First of all, I'll give you some backstage news before the personal speculation. I spoke to a lot of people in new Japan or AEW rather. I, I did sp speak to Lance Hoyt uh, in new Japan. Great interview. It's up now, but the people in AEW that I spoke to were like, we don't see it happening. And the, these weren't top EVPs or anything, but yeah. they're like, the Bucks and Kenny Omega were treated really bad on the way out, and there's some still some hurt feelings there. Time heals all wounds, but it'll take time to heal that one. And I'm like, man, it has been a year. But then if you listen to my Davey Boy Smith Jr. interview that's about to drop in a couple weeks, he talks about how when he wanted to go to Impact that Ghetto was like, no, they screwed over Okada nine years ago. Yeah, I remember. It was and Bushi, wasn't it? No, it was Okada. Was it Okada? It was Okada. I thought it was Ibushi. Okay. No, it was Okada. Okay. And they were like, oh, Jeff Jarrett screwed him over. And no. Jeff Jarrett ain't there anymore, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah. Not only that, Jeff Jarrett hasn't been there like five, six regimes ago. Yeah. And then they're like, well, maybe it's because of some bad dealings with the, the fight, uh, New Japan, Jarrett thing. Like there's a lot of – that's a thing that Davey Boy points out to me. And he was like, they – take things seriously and they do not forgive people for them and that that's been i think an issue that maybe has i don't want to say hindered new japan because they're doing fine but yeah. i personally think new japan will wait and see how their u.s tour dates do mm -hmm. without the likes of aew mm -hmm. if i'm aew in new japan i find a way to make this work jimmy okada on All Out, Double or Nothing, that's good business. I agree. Kenny Omega, The Bucks, Cody on Dominion and uh, Wrestle Kingdom, that's good business. I agree. Okada being on Dynamite once every four or five months is real good business. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Because they don't have a cable TV presence right now because Impact blew their wad morons <laughs> and said, oh, you don't want to work with us? Yeah. We'll get off our channel. That was so stupid. Instead of developing and cultivating a relationship and showing them we're going to put on some good wrestling, and then maybe you know maybe it starts with Impact wrestlers getting booked on New Japan USA dates or mm -hmm. something like that. And they made like, that decision weeks before Wrestle Kingdom. Maybe so they, yeah. they could have aired Wrestle Kingdom on Access and gotten ratings. Exactly. Yeah, could have aired it. Could have decided to air it right before Impact Wrestling. Right. 
used it as a lead in. Right. Could have done something like that. Yeah. But no, they didn't want to do it. You mean to tell me that having the Young Bucks or even Trent and Chuck on some of these New Japan USA shows wouldn't help? I know it would help them. Yeah. I know it would. Like, it makes too much sense, Jimmy. And the wrestlers want to work there. Jericho works there. Moxley yeah. works there. Omega had it written in his contract that he could work there. Ah, it just makes so much sense. And I'm not there having the conversations. But it really does seem like the people that I've talked to and Chris Jericho saying what he said, and he wouldn't say that if he didn't have some insight. Mm -hmm. It seems like hurt feelings, and I understand. Sometimes you get your feelings hurt, but if it makes sense for the fans and for business, why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, I mean, if, if it comes down to, say, hurt feelings from Omega and the Bucks kind of thing, then all it really takes is Tony Khan telling them to smarten the fuck up because business is business. If it's hurt feelings from the New Japan side, again, I mean, I, I look at it like this, and I've said this before. Harold, how, how do people say you're supposed to pronounce his last name? Maij? May? May. He, again, is, is new enough to the business that he doesn't have those, those built-in relationships with the Ring of Honor. Tony Khan is new enough to the business that he doesn't have those relationships with New Japan. I think that it takes Harold May and Tony Khan as, yes. as, as the intermediary, uh, intermediaries. They have to be the guys that step in and look at it from a strictly a business perspective. And Harold May tells whoever's got her feelings in New Japan to smarten up. Tony Khan tells the Bucks and Omega, smarten up. And they just kind of get the deal done. I mean, I think it's got to come down to Tony Khan and Harold May. Those have to be the guys. For for as brilliant as the booking in New Japan is so often, it is it is just amazing to me, Jimmy, when I heard Davey Boy Smith Jr. sit there and say, yeah, I wanted to take some impact dates because I'm tour to tour. And they were like, what, what? No, they screwed over Okada a decade ago. Yeah. <laughs> a decade ago. Yeah. Not only that, they tried one, Ghetto tried to pretend he didn't speak English to Davy Boy Smith Jr. Uh cute. Cute. Like his partner wasn't gonna tell him, yeah, he speaks English. Uh, uh but the fact that you say that when it's documented, you've worked with Jeff Jarrett since then. Uh -huh. They blamed it on impact. And when they when Davy Boy's like, well, it was ten years ago, they blamed it on Jarrett. When they said, Well, Jarrett's not there, oh, oh, but but Man, get over it and do good business. And I get, I understand it. It's the same thing that we complain about WWE for. I understand you're making money, but you could make more money. Yeah, and by the way, when you're making more money, you can produce better content too. I don't see the negative in producing better content and making more money as a result. I hope it happens because it would. It would just increase things so much, the, the profile of both companies. And definitely their U.S. footprint on, on New Japan World. Yeah. They're going to increase their U.S. subs if they do this deal, too. So and there's, losing, there's a lot of reasons. And the thing is, losing New Japan doesn't hurt anybody. That's the thing. Like, a lot of people say, oh, well, back in the day, you could lose in Japan and nobody would know. New Japan is so good at protecting people mm. and making things work that it just doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah, and, and, you're right. And look, not, not only that, but I, you know, let's say Jericho lost uh, at Wrestle Kingdom, let's say. Mm -hmm. They just don't air any footage on Dynamite, and within two weeks it's forgotten anyway. You yeah, but I mean, like, it's easy to get around it. Yeah, and I got to say, New Japan had AEW guys go 3 and 0 this weekend. Yeah, I mean, awesome. it was it was it was pretty obvious to me when uh, when Jericho said, "If I lose, I'll give him a title shot." It was pretty obvious to me he was winning. Sure, but, uh, but yeah, I I think it makes a lot of sense. So, but still, it is Tanahashi at the Tokyo Dome. So there's sure. always that doubt. So you mentioned uh, New Japan's U.S. tour. So it's starting on January 24th in St. Petersburg, Florida. They're going to be doing five days between uh, then and February 1st. They've released the the lineups for them, and I had a look. And obviously, they're going to be bringing in a lot of domestic talent, which makes sense because it's cheaper. They are bringing in some of the big guns. Abushi is advertised. Tanahashi is advertised. No Okada on any of those five shows. No Okada. Do you know the reason behind that? I don't. Um, now, see, the thing is, when I talked to Lance Hoyt last week, he was specific in saying to me, this is not a brand extension. This is not like NXT UK. Yep. This is additional dates for what we already have. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that makes sense, but... Now, he says that you are going to see new names on there. You are going to see some people that that are going to be featured heavily. But, yeah, it, it is a little bit weird that Okada isn't featured. But, I mean, uh, 
I don't know how committed they are right now to that. If they if they brought Okada over, I think that'd be a real indication of how good New Japan USA dates could do. Mm. Uh, no disrespect to Bullet Club and the guys they took over. They're sending over Tanahashi mm -hmm. and Ibushi and stuff like that. But like right out of the gate, those guys are featured in some like 10-person tags. Jeff Cobb wasn't even on the final battle and he's going to be on the show. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, Cole Cabana is going to be on the show. Yeah. So they are using some people that they haven't been using heavily, like Mysterioso, uh, Alex Zane. Hey, local, local guy to me, Lexington. Hopefully I can interview him soon. I, I'm interested in the approach because I think that the attraction of new Japan and USA isn't here's the new Japan logo with a bunch of USA guys on it. I think it's, Here's New Japan Pro Wrestling, but we're doing it in the U.S. That's what they're hoping for, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. You mentioned, uh, we talked about an impact a little bit because you just mentioned, you know, the whole Access TV thing and they booted New Japan because they wouldn't give them the deal. What is the word on this supposed internal investigation about an executive in Impact Wrestling? What is the deal on that? Uh, the investigation did happen. I was able to confirm that. Um there are some non-disclosures in play there with some. I, I can't. I'm. I don't know if I'm allowed to name names effectively, but it ain't hard to figure out based on who left Impact Wrestling and there were two people that were connected mm -hmm. and an executive. I, I heard that. I heard that the rumors, or not the rumors, the reports of the investigation were true. That was confirmed to me by Access and Anthem. But yeah. It, there was a grievance uh, that was issued and an investigation was launched. Anthem says that they didn't find anything, but I'm not able to really confirm that. I'm just able to confirm that uh, that an investigation did happen. Okay, well, you know what, Sean? It's the first episode of a new month. And so uh, <laughs> we said that we were gonna we were gonna experiment with kind of, you know, breaking up the timing and doing this stuff, but because it's the first episode of a new month, Camillo, let's go to Stupid People. Stupid People is what this segment's called. You might wonder why we do it. It's not about wrestling at all. Used to be WWE's weekly usage of stupid nicknames, which we did hoping they'd stop giving wrestlers lame names. But it didn't work, so we gave up. In the new segment, we came up with this Stupid People. Stupid People. Stupid People. Duh. All right, so uh, go to FIFOSelect.com after this for The List Goes On. We're going to talk about NWA Power. We're going to talk about Drew McIntyre, Rey Mysterio, Mandy Rose, CM Punk, Booker T, Lars Sullivan. An interesting thing that came out with him. You know what I'm talking about, Sean? We're going to talk about all of that on The List Goes On after this. Uh, but first, oh, and, and I always say this, I want to see feedback. Uh, it can be in YouTube comments. It can yeah. be on Twitter. I want feedback. Do you like stupid people? You want more of it? Less of feedback it? Feedback on everything, man. Like, I, I got to say, the only benefit of having a YouTube channel is I don't have 4,500 videos, some of which didn't perform well. So the algorithm is being kind of kind to me of late. Oh, there you go. There you nice. Go. <laughs> Seeing a few thousand views on everything I do. There you go. So this first one, this is reported by the Canadian Press. You're going to love this, man. So the leading packaged meats company in Canada is called Maple Leaf Foods. And anybody that's watching this that's Canadian, they know what Maple Leaf Foods is. I want to show you the logo for Maple Leaf Foods. Camilla, do you have the logo? All right, that is the logo for Maple Leaf Foods, which, again, is the leading packaged meats company in Canada. So, you know, you get your bacon and all that stuff. Maple, sure. Leaf, Maple Leaf is a big brand. There's an 8-year-old boy out of Quebec. His name is Jacob Bertrand. And he's a fan of the Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team, even though he's from Quebec. His stepmother ordered him a Maple Leafs cake for his birthday from a local bakery. And maybe because they were in Quebec, for some reason, the bakery only had a Montreal Canadiens logo on hand. So the stepmother said, just Google it. Very easy to find. Maple Leafs logo. They got the cake. What do you think happened? Put up the image, Camillo. Look at that, Sean. <laughs> they somehow put the Maple Leaf meat logo on this poor kid's cake for his eighth birthday. Uh, the good news, though, is that Maple Leafs Foods jumped on this PR opportunity, and they are sending the family to Toronto for a Toronto Maple Leafs hockey game. 
So That's awesome. Yeah, good for them for making this. I could not believe. I understand you're in Quebec and everything. The Toronto Maple Leafs are a nationally recognized yes. major entity. And across most, Yeah, internationally. They are internationally recognized. So whether you're based in Canadian, Montreal Canadiens territory or not, you damn well should know the Toronto Maple Leafs logo. But uh, somehow they got some idiot that didn't and put the packaged meat company on the cake. So good job to you. That's a pretty good one. My God. This next one, okay, there's going to be an audio clip associated with this one. Sean's not able to hear the audio while we're doing this, so I'm going to repeat uh, one of the quotes to Sean afterwards because this was crazy. So this was reported by the Denver Post on December 18th. There is a radio talk show in Denver called The Chuck and Julie Show. It was on 710 KNUS. It was hosted by Chuck Bonnewell and Julie Hayden. Okay? On the December 18 edition, they were talking about the Donald Trump impeachment story. Uh, and this guy, Chuck Bonnewell, he was trying to make a point about how the impeachment news was never ending. And all yeah. anybody's talking about is the impeachment news. Um, he said something that got him in hot water. Here's a clip. This is courtesy of, of Kyle, uh, Kyle Clark of NBC News 9 in Denver. Camillo, put up the clip, and then, Sean, I'll read you the quote afterwards. Put up the clip, Camillo. All right, Chuck Pano, Julie Hayden here a little after 1.30, talking about the never-ending impeachment of Donald <laughs> Trump. Yeah, you wish for a nice school shooting to, to no, interrupt no, the monopoly. No, no, don't even say that. No, don't even say that. Don't call us, Wait, Chuck. Which, didn't which, say that. No, which no one would be hurt. <laughs> All right, let's go to Jim in Littleton. Jim, you're up. So this idiot, when trying to make a point that there's too much news about the impeachment and that they should, you know, the, he liked things to be broken up, he said, quote, you know, you wish for a nice school shooting to interrupt. Mm. Like, here's the thing. I say lots of dumb stuff, Jimmy, that's well documented. That guy just looks like he is always in the mood to say stupid shit. Yeah, he looks like an asshole. He looks like a dumbass. And yeah. hey. Looks can be deceiving, but in this case, not so much. Feel free. Judge a book by its cover every once in a while. And you know what? Sometimes sometimes you can say, oh, people talk before thinking and stuff like that. The fact that that even entered his mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? The fact that it even entered his mind to say, oh, we need a good school shooting to interrupt all this impeachment. Unbelievable that he would even God think damn. of that. And uh, 710 KNUS, they responded by canceling the show the same day. Yep, later. Same and, uh, day. So I, I could only read. I'm guessing that woman was like, please don't say that. Yes, yeah, she did. Yes, yeah, she did. And she she knew. Yep, she said it immediately, and then she immediately cut to, I think they had somebody else that they were going to be talking to or something. Yeah. And she immediately cut to them. And so I don't know the uh, I don't know what's happening with uh, Julie Hayden, but I hope that they took care of her because she did nothing yes. wrong. It was this idiot, Chuck Bonnewell. I hope he never works on radio again. That was stupid. That you would even yep. that that would even cross your mind to say something like that. What yeah. a moron. Yep. This last one, Sean, for the SRS file was sent in by Sean Rossap. This one. I've sent you a couple. Well, I, I'm using one, and okay. uh, and uh, people are gonna like this. So a couple of years ago, the Hasbro company gifted us with a great new game. And uh, this is a couple of years old, and we have the commercial for the game. It's called Don't Step In It. Camilla, put up that commercial for the game. Whoa, -ho, that's a lot of poop. Don't Step In It. It's the outrageous new game from Hasbro Gaming. Can you cross the map without stepping in doo-doo? High step it, side step it. Just try not to step in it. Adult assembly and supervision required. So apparently it was a big success. Because now they make special editions of the game, and Sean gave me one of these, including the Llama edition. Camilla's yes. got a picture of that. Do you have those pictures, Camilla? There's the Llama edition. Uh, they have the laughing llama. <laughs> they have the reindeer edition. Do you have that one, Camilla? Ooh, that was in time for the holidays. And they have the unicorn edition. Look at that, Sean. Oh my God. Where it's rainbow colored poop. I love the laughing unicorns and llama. Right, llama, llamas. Yeah. I think it's llama. llama uh, but I think that's right. Llama. Do you have this game? No, I don't have this How game. How are you going to teach your kids to not step in unicorn shit if they don't play the game? Now, I, I know that 
Some people don't even have grass in their backyard. They have artificial turf, <laughs> but and don't have to worry about that. But, <laughs> okay, but so so first off, you know that was nice, and you stepped in, and it was fine. It was wonderful. It was I'm good. Saying, I've got rubber. I've got rubber underneath in. it so that the kids won't get hurt if they fall. I didn't step in any llama shit back there either. There was no llama shit back there. Yeah, that's very true. But the the, the thing about it is that you got to be blindfolded. So how are you going to learn not to step in shit anyway? You're blindfolded. Your senses, man. Oh, it's the senses. You know, like, you train like your daredevil, man. So do you know the rules? Like, let's say that your toe touches the top of the poop. Is that still okay if you then pivot and step away? Is that still okay? Or are you still disqualified? I don't have the game, Jimmy. I was asking you. Oh, I, I, I didn't do enough research. So what I have a tragedy. No idea. All right, a couple more stories for you. Uh, I want to talk about this Kelly Klein, BJ Whitmer thing, because oh. I'm gonna I'm gonna put Sean Ross Sapp over, and that's the reason why I'm gonna talk okay. about it, because I'm gonna put Sean Ross Sapp over. So you know they say there's two sides to every story, Sean, right? Mm -hmm. uh, back in November, it came out that Kelly Klein had been fired by Ring of Honor. She was the women's champion at the time, and it came out that she had been fired. Joey Mercury went to town on social media. He was kind of psychotic on how crazy he, he went on social media. He blasted Ring of Honor, blasted, I'm sorry, what's the general manager's name again? Greg Gilliland? Greg Gilliland. Yeah. Blasted him for the treatment of Kelly Klein. She came out, she claimed that she was making under $24,000 a year as women's champion, uh, claimed that they uh, didn't, take, uh, treat, uh, didn't take care of her with her medical treatment. She had gotten injured on a tour or something like that. On January 2nd, B.J. Whitmer, who's a former wrestler in Ring of Honor, he's a producer now in AEW, and the husband of, uh, of Kelly Klein, he posted this on Twitter, which he has since taken down, and, and I think he deleted his Twitter account, but on January 2nd, he posted this No, on no, he got suspended. Oh, he got suspended, did he? Yes, for doxing. Doxing? What's that? Yes. What's that? Putting people's personal info out there. And is this what he got suspended for, what I just put on the screen? No. This is B.J. Whitmer. Yeah, B.J. Uh, Whitmer. That's who I'm talking about. No, no, no. Joey Mercury got his uh, account suspended. B.J. deleted his Twitter and then put it or got it back. Oh, he did put. Okay, so this is what he put on January 2nd. He said, I have a personal statement to make. My wife, Kelly Klein, and I are divorcing. This is happening because Kelly breached the trust in our relationship. Blah, 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 blah. The reason I'm mentioning the story, because, you know, people's personal business is their personal business. Yeah. I'm mentioning the story for two reasons. The first reason is because there's two sides to every story. So whenever you hear, oh, woe is me to this person and they treated me like crap and whatever, you never know if there might be another side that's not out yet. The other reason I'm mentioning this is because Sean Ross Sapp knew this story before BJ Whitmer posted that on Twitter. And to Sean Ross Sapp's credit, he did not report on it. Uh, because yeah. he thought it wasn't something that was really something that you should report on. Sean told me about this before BJ posted that, and so I was aware of it. But kudos to you that you decided, you know what, this is the kind of story I'm going to kind of stay away from. And then uh, BJ on his own, and he even said in that screenshot, he said he wanted to get it out there before the wrestling media picked it up. But Sean said nothing, so kudos to you, bud. So, I mean, yeah, my, my line of thought in that is, quite frankly, I don't care who's fucking who. I mean, they can do that on their own. Right. I don't care who's sending dick pictures to somebody else. And the thing is, as long as it's legal and consensual, sure. When something happens and a wrestler makes a personal statement, then we run it. Then it becomes news. Right. If a police, if a police report or an arrest is involved, then it becomes news to us. Otherwise, I just don't care. Like, if somebody asks me offhand, is this wrestler dating this person, I might be like, yeah, they are or something like that, but I'm not going to run a full news story on it. And or at least that's my line of thinking now. Fortunately, we got guys like Jeremy Lambert and Carlos Toro who are already on like the same wavelength with me like that. And I said there was there was more to all that story than than came out in Newsweek. And I didn't feel comfortable with us utilizing a lot of it. Yeah. And there, yeah, that's that's kind of a reason why. Right. Awesome. Uh, Brock Lesnar at the Royal Rumble. I know there's been some criticism. He's going to be number one in the Rumble. He's the WWE champion. I, I saw on the Post Raw podcast you were kind of critical about, you know, he's, he's, he's a part-timer already, and he's the champion, and the belt's not on TV, and now he's in the Rumble. I want to kind of see how it plays out because I want to know if there's going to be a stipulation if the Rumble's going to be for the title. Like I'd cool. like to, yeah, I'd like to know if that's going to happen. My gut tells me he's going to get eliminated by whoever then challenges him at WrestleMania for the title. That that's what I think is probably going to happen. 
but I, I want to hold that out. I do like that they're trying to do something different. I mean, obviously, back in 92, uh, when the title was held up, the t- number 92 Royal Rumble was for the championship, and the winner became the champion, which was Ric Flair. But uh, I guess the champion has never been in the Rumble. For some reason, I feel like Hogan yes. was in the Rumble, but he wasn't number yes. one. He champion has been in the Rumble. Hogan was champion and won it. Uh, but that's before a title shot was on the line, too. Right. They didn't start that until Yokozuna because they had the one where Ric Flair was champion and yep. all that. Roman Reigns defended the title when he was in it, and then Triple H won it. But, yeah, he, they, they weren't number one, or I don't think Triple H or Hogan wasn't number one. I can't remember what number Reigns was, but I'm, I'm open to it. But, man, Brock Lesnar did not and does not need that title belt. That was a giant misstep. Lesnar, if he wanted to be champion, he should have beaten Seth Rollins at SummerSlam. The Fiend should have beaten Kofi Kingston. We could have avoided the Hell in a Cell crown jewel messes. Yeah, you're right. Or just don't put the title on Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar with the Money in the Bank briefcase terrorizing everybody across both shows, Jimmy, because that briefcase gives him the ability to jump would have fixed a lot of that weird, oh, he got traded. Oh, no, he didn't. Oh, but this happened. Bullshit they put out there. Meanwhile, Seth Rollins could have been so paranoid and terrorized by Brock Lesnar coming after his title that he enlists the help of AOP and becomes a total asshole because he's paranoid. Because this Seth Rollins is a world champion. Mm -hmm. The one that we saw before, meh. I agree. I agree. Yep. The, I guess the only issue with the Money in the Bank thing is if they handled it the way they did creatively the first time when Brock had Seth beat in the middle of the ring, and mm-hmm. then for whatever reason he just wouldn't cash in because he's like, I'm gonna wait till Crown Jewel. You know what I mean? So they, yeah. remember when they were doing stupid stuff like that. But I agree, it makes sense. It gives it gives a reason people like to see the surprise of you know the champion is down and there's Brock's music kind of thing. Exactly, and he doesn't yeah. even have to be there. He doesn't even have to be there. Right, right. But they hear the music and then everybody's like, oh, here we go, kind of thing. That's how you lead to a good distraction finish, too. Because if it's Brock Lesnar's music that you hear, you're going to take the focus away from whoever you're wrestling. This ain't like uh, Kurt Hawkins and Zack Ryder, all due respect, coming out and their music hitting or Ziggler's or somebody. If Brock Lesnar's music hits and you're facing somebody, you're going to be like, I should probably be concerned about this. Let me focus my attention on it. Right. Uh, one last thing I got for you: the wedding official tackle. Was that planned? I heard that that was planned. Yeah, according, uh, it was confirmed to me after Ryan's report that it was. But I've got a little bit more on FightfulSelect.com. Subscribe, guys. Was it a rib? Uh, like, I, why? Why? I, I don't I understand. Don't why would that people be planned? Were, people were kept in the dark about it, and the the high level people that I talked to haven't gotten back to me on it, but. They were kept in the dark on it, but it was supposed to happen, which is weird. But I, I had a feeling, and it was confirmed by those that I talked to. They were like, oh, well, when they cut to it in the ring, yeah. that's when we knew that this was something that's supposed to happen. But then they cut away really quickly. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I, I don't have a my, uh, any type of insight on the why. I just know that it was supposed to happen, and people were kept in the dark about it. The only thing that I can think of, because we know that Vincent Mann can be a real asshole— the only thing I can possibly think of, so I, I uh, it came out I think last week that Vince McMahon, uh for Raw last week he wasn't there for the start of the taping, but by the time the wedding angle took place, Vince got to the building because he wanted to see the wedding angle. The only thing I could think of is that Vince, for some reason, either took a shining to the wedding official or didn't like the wedding official, and so yeah. as a, as a rib on him, he had security <laughs> tackle. That I mean, because because you know that the man would do yeah, shit yeah, like yeah. that. The only thing I can think of, because he's in Gorilla and he's and he's kind of running production, I could see Vince telling security to tackle him and then telling the cameraman to 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 catch it. Sure. And the official not knowing it was coming. That's the only thing that makes any sense to me that uh, the man would have done that. Yeah, I agree. And if he did, what an asshole! If 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 it comes that's, out that's that Vince. that's what happened, yeah, that's Vince. That's almost assault if that's what that happened. That is. So that is well, guys, we have lots of cool stuff coming for you uh, this week. We have that Chris Michaels interview. Uh, I'm dropping next week a bunch more interviews. But this weekend, hard to kill NXT UK. And then the week after that, Conor McGregor fights. My God. What do you got in that up. one? <sighs> Donald Cerrone. Yeah. By decision. Uh, I think submission. Really? Is it five rounds? 
I believe so. I believe so. So, guys, make sure you all check it out. I will be doing a preview on that. I know the MMA podcast is on hiatus, but I'll be doing a preview for that and a review after the show, of course, live on YouTube. Might even do like a live like watch-along type of gimmick that worked yet well for the Tito Del Rio thing, but lots of stuff coming up on Fightful.com. Leave a thumbs up, subscribe. Check out FightfulSelect.com. We're out.